I think fans are usually uh, on Instagram, and then, uh, was it three years ago? Four years ago now. It's been four years. Was it 2020? In August. Um, I think it was August. We did a shoot talks on Instagram Live. That's the first time I chatted. And then it's already been four years. So I feel like it's like, you know, back then we were also asking about, like, oh, what do you think you'll be doing in five years? And like, it's already almost five years. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. But um, yeah, it'll be nice to kind of recap and also we're visiting. Um, so we're going to travel a little bit. And we'll be after. So that's kind of like where we're going to go. And then we have some questions. Some people online have given me questions to ask too. So um, we'll do that. And it is recorded on Zoom, and I'll try to cut it shorter because the 30 minutes in the beginning is just us talking. And then we will um, post it on YouTube so people can watch later. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, um, should we do the, uh, um, yeah. the PowerPoint first? Yeah, so the slideshow? So this is Michelle. My name is Yuji Mianheb, I'm a, a bespoke shoemaker from Adelaide, Australia and I'm here in New York with some family for over a fifth year. I just want to say first up, the best thing about being a shoemaker is that an end product is completely practical and yet the opportunity for beauty always <laughs> so this is my first pair of shoes that I made in 1990. So I was um, 15 and I did it for work experience when I was at school. Um, I just happened to have some local shoe makers in my small channel when I had kids. So next, this So I went to a Steiner store and I decided to do my final year project, which is a pretty big deal with the Steiner education, um, the history of shoe fashions and also how to make the shoes from those years. So I made about seven pairs and also a pair of glasses. So it was pretty, as you can imagine, pretty steep learning curve um, in one year to make all of those. Um, maybe about the third or fourth pair that I've made, I think the top pair coincided with um, me having also just learned to drive. No. <laughs> so I remember driving home with these shoes that I just made in the seat next to me and just such a high. Like, right, that's all I want to do for the rest of my life is make shoes. Cool. So from that project I discovered and interviewed an old Bulgarian master shoemaker called George Kohler. So in January 1993 um, I did his intensive course. So this is a picture from his course. He so happened to be in Australia? He lived in Australia, he came to live in Australia. Wow. Um, so he, he hadn't, I think maybe it was after the war he came and he hadn't been shoemaking for a long time. And then he started taking it again, just doing his private intensive courses. Wow. So not only was I lucky that um, George was teaching, I was also lucky that um, Tim Skirm, who is on the left, um, was had come to Adelaide to learn how to teach shoemaking through George, and so he was on the same course. Wow. So, so George had also um, he done a seven year apprenticeship in Bulgaria when he was like from a fourteen year old, and you know at the time you think seven years. Like that's so full on, it's like become a shoemaker for seven years. But seven years is like that magical time frame that 
everything starts to come forward into place and you start feeling confident. And that kind of made sense to me after my second day. Tim and I, um, I, he sort of took me under his wing a little bit and mm -hmm. I was just sort of learning a lot more from Tim than mm -hmm. George on that course. Mm -hmm. um, and from then, we, he kind of, it was like an unofficial apprentice situation for the next couple of maybe five to eight years. Um, and he started up a workshop for which I used his work. Um, so after that course, I also did um, a year at a technical college. Um, so I'd had my original teacher teachers in the in the hills, and then I had George, and then I had Tim, and then I had the tech college teachers. Um, and as you know, shoemakers all do things differently, yeah. and they were all saying different things, and I, I found it quite blustering and confusing, but. It wasn't until years later that I thought actually it's really useful because I can pick each of what they do best or what makes sense to me and use those two. Yeah. Um, so the next yeah. question. A technical college, it's just amazing. I think we had this conversation before too, but having that technical college teaching shoemaking is like great. Yes. <laughs> so it actually. Um, Mm. But it was great having it in Adelaide because there was a community mm. and you know, they'd come and visit my workshop and, and you know, the suppliers would have a reason to have supplies because there was a school. So um, this is obviously hand rocked work that I learned at George's course. Um, and I did make a few pairs of water tube, maybe like three or four pairs, but it's actually not something that I do. I don't, um, I don't have a clientele that's willing to pay for that. So, um, so it's like, um, yeah. you've done it, but done it, it. yeah, yeah did it, it, done it, <laughs> check. Yeah, all my work is done on the way to yeah, I'm like, there's nothing wrong to sum up past it, I think, you know? And it's, yeah. Yeah. And there's still custom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the thing I'm always like, is it still bespoke if it's yeah. cement lax, cement construction? Custom. I don't know. Maybe. But I think it's okay. Yeah, it's Mm-hmm. So this is my living room when I was about 19 years old. Um, so I began collecting and hoarding <laughs> um, all the different tools and equipment. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty hard to find um, more uh, well, equipment and um, lasts everything. Um, and getting harder and harder with her doing the industry as well. So um, I feel like I've also become a bit of a, a, an Adelaide last custodian. Um, you know, people want to get rid of things and so I'm the first point of contact and I sort of try and marry up equipment with maybe potential students or people that are still uh, so the next yeah. one is so uh, exhibition work is um, obviously the most interesting work for me. Um, I, tr I, also, I try and incorporate it in my work to keep me excited um, to do make things that I want to make. Um, so in 1994, I started like a market store next to my uh, white father was a jeweler so we had jewelry and shoes together um, and then we moved into a retail store um, it was um it was called the silver shop and it was like a community um cooperative so there were lots of jewelers and my shoes and it was a fantastic 
support for all of us and me and um, great opportunity to um, do exhibition work because mm -hmm. um, we're in the centre of the city. You guys took turns like manning the store, kind of like yeah. that kind of collective, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, it was always obviously Friday, Saturdays, and yeah, the functions with some tight jams. So that shop continued until 2007. Mm -hmm. um, so the next slide is more exhibition work. Nice. So there's a um, with a, a, a piece of jewelry that my brother made. He's also a jeweler. Mm. Top pair of shoes. Mm. Did you carve the wood heel? Uh, not wood heels, but did you carve any of the heels? Uh, so the bottom one is not a pair. It's just one shoe and. My dad and I experimented a bit with um, sand casting aluminum. Mm. Um, and there's only one of them because it was made on a, an antique last off tin skirts that there was only one of, which is tiny and probably about the size of one or two. Whoa. Um, and so I covered it in Shirovsky crystals. Yeah. And did that whole. <laughs> you know, on the soles of the shoe. Yeah. Wow. The proportion of it is quite bizarre because it's so visual and the aluminium feels quite heavy. Yeah. And because if there's only one, it's unwearable, um, which was fine with me because I couldn't figure out how to nail the aluminium heel on. <laughs> yeah. Um, the ones above them, oh. are those that you go with it? So I think the theme for that exhibition, because we've been at the silk shop for 10 years, it was 10 squared. Mm -hmm. I think I, there's um, five squares going up with the stitching in between. Mm -hmm. oh. So each pair for that particular exhibition had the second of 10. Ten. So yeah, next slide. So everyone always asks me, what's your favourites? So I thought I'd put out some of my favourites. Um, so predominantly I make women's shoes, um, mostly because I like making pretty things. I like making ladies' shoes because they're smaller and they fit in my hands. <laughs> um, so the um, pink fabric gingham pair fabric yeah, thing were made in the 90s sometime, I can't remember exactly. And then the other pair I made, I think it was 2020. Mm -hmm. It's a 1920s Perugia, an Italian designer, a copy from um, a picture that my customer bought me of his work. Um, she was doing her PhD curating historical costume and clothing, so she's fascinated with that. So that was like seriously difficult in every way. Mm -hmm. I kind of hated making them, but they ended up turning out to be my favourites. Um, just with, like I was saying before, with all the variables with some of my customers. Um, so you know, not only is she, she fussy, she wears orthotics. Mm. And you know, the, the fancy stitching and the piping, and, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just the, the entry um, is not particularly supportive either because the buttons had were elasticized. Okay. So you know, there's no choice in how she wears it, which mm. I don't often get my customers do because they can change the fit. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, they were. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so bespoke making is is complex because of all of those reasons. So it's not just the expectations of the customer, but their 
their fittings, their orthotics, the materials, all the variables put together make it different every time. Mm -hmm. Next that keeps slide. it interesting too, I guess, for you. Like it's never yeah. the same pair. Never the same, never yeah. the same. Yeah. So, and you know, my notes here say bespoke equals the definition of challenging. <laughs> um, so, these are just some of my customers. A, a short statured lady who's a performer, and I think they were her wedding shoes. This lady has really long, narrow feet and mm. doesn't like the look of them being long and narrow. So just try to get those expectations and do certain design techniques to try and not make them look long and narrow. This lady had one leg 10 centimetres shorter than the other. Mm. Um, so most major shoe manufacturers, they employ a designer to make it prototypes. Um, they spend all their time to get all those variables that I was talking about to work together and then that's what they mass produced. And they mass produce. Whereas I don't get the chance to you know, make prototypes. Um, and so I have a, a general motto is to get it right the first time. Mm -hmm. So I spend that was your motto, I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so spend the time, double check, triple check, check again, check again, and, and um, and then you know having fittings and we, because you don't want to do that. But when the, the price point is at a certain point, yeah, it's um, it's not viable to make prototypes. Mm. Um. To the next one. So I have a, a range of customers like my short statured lady and an extra broad oh, and long and narrow, orthopedic, the lady with the purple hair at the top, I've been making shoes for, for 25 years. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, Often when my customers initiate an order, whether they kind of know it or not from the beginning, what they end up for is going for a ride. And the whole process is what they're paying for in their yeah. story. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, what they end up with is not only a pair of shoes at the end, but having been immersed in the journey of their creation. Mm. So um, that's that's fine. We have it to make. So then, dreams. Um, so the next slide is just a couple of. Um, so this was a customer's original pair, and then she wanted a copy. Yes, and she wanted a copy. So I did a few old favourites for people. Sometimes that is difficult Wait. because of componentry. Exactly the same here right. or, um, So next slide. Yep. Um, Whoa. <laughs> orthopedic work. Um, again, um, it's pretty challenging work um, yep. that I sometimes try and avoid. So these clients can often be really grateful, but often have really high expectations. Um, so this lady had polio as a child. Some people have congenital issues, sometimes it's through accidents. Mm. Um, I think my favourite part about this work is doing the last adapt. Um, so um, that's got to Yeah. So next one. Yeah. So I also make people. Yes. <laughs> so this is um, my children at work. So uh, is that you? <laughs> and this is Aurelia <laughs> in the middle with Tim Skern. Uh huh. Um, so she, uh, born in two thousand five, 
and then the twins were born to your as I said. Mm. Um, so that's Ginger on the left. Um, so mm. they used to come to the workshop with me maybe about three days a week, um, on and off. So it was definitely challenging, but such a privilege to be able to combine it. Yeah. Um, watching grow up. Um, so I often did lots of work duties at home. Mm. You might catch up my patterns and apples at home mm. and have my sewing machine at home. And then obviously with the kids at work, I did lots of child duties at work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Aurelia is now 19 mm. and the twins are 16. So it's been a great trade to be able to blend with motherhood, mm -hmm. um, just with all those small processes and steps that is okay to be interrupted. Um, mostly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mentorship. So, over the years, I have done some um, quite a few mentorships with aspiring shoemakers mm -hmm. um, who've often done some prior learning before and they're just coming to the mm -hmm. their processes. Um, and then about four years ago, just before COVID, I started doing some um, nice. classes, um, just really tiny classes. Um, yeah, no, just my notes saying I, I feel now a sense of you know, um, being the elder <laughs> and um, wanting to pass on my skills and also kind of try and foster a community. Yeah. Um, you know, it's dying and harder yeah. to keep people in and around. Yeah. Who is this person? This is Becky. Mm. Becky Blue. Baby Shoemaker. Yeah, check. I'm not sure she, I know she's just had a baby. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure she's doing as much shoe work, more than mm. work. Mm -hmm. um, so next slide. Okay. So um, Tim in the late nineties, obviously there was a massive gap in the market because he was teaching and how do you teach without a textbook? And so um, he spent years writing his book. Um, and um, yeah, so should I bring the book? It's too late. Yeah, okay, I'll bring it. So, the Scottish Shoemaking are comprehensive by the handmade footwear. Um, so, I remember him learning to type just to, so he could write the book. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he had a book launch in, I think it was 2006. And I did a opening. Oh, that's cool. That's right when I basically. Yeah, I got, I got, I think I got the first, um, yeah, when it came out, it was like a big deal yeah. <laughs> over here too. Yeah. These are the books. So, um, you want to take a look at around it? So components are getting harder and harder to get. Um, yeah. The industry is getting smaller and smaller in Australia. Um, there's only a few manufacturers left. But there's manufacturers left. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so only, yeah, and only a handful of the smaller makers as well. Mm. So our, our Adelaide is quite well known for our and women's shoes. Um, so that's our Australia's biggest manufacturer. So even my suppliers are ha finding it hard to um, get supplies because they have to get people a bit of milk. I'm not willing to do that, so that um, every other month there's, oh no, we can't get that in um, So that's, that's a real challenge. Um, and yeah, just always having to kind of think, of it, think ahead about, oh, I've only got half a roll of Arnold's um, beige branding, how am I going to get that again? <laughs> um, and you know, try and drill my local supplier, oh, do you think you might be able to source that? Yeah. That's a constant 
do you not have like shoe repair places that? Yes, but not all of the componentry that like a shoe repairer never uses a toe cuff. Yeah. Oh. So. Yeah, and so also being a bespoke shoemaker, it means that I offer lots of different styles, which means I have to have the materials and the componentry for all those styles. Um, so, next, so these are my favourite tools. Um, my scribing knife, which is about 30 years old. Um, a tiny pair of they're actually uh, jewellery pliers and pieces that my late father gave me. I am very beautiful this week. <laughs> um, and my lasting pieces, which are really sloppy and old and feel like extensions of my hair. And there's not a photo here, but my treadle sewing machine. I have to be very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So there's that turn, that shoe making turn, but the last comes first. Yeah. So um, as well as upper making, my favourite process is the last adapting. Um, mostly because it, it's, it's a form of sculpture. Um, so I start start with standard lasts. I find from my thousands of lasts, I find something that's closest to the client's measurements. And then I start um, building them up with a six millimeter EVA. So you can't really tell from this picture. Um, this lady has this is a recent um, distinction, really broad feet, um, very square, and she wanted pointy shoes. So this is starting the last building process for hers. Um, so the 6 mil EVA, it's kind of thick enough when I heat it um, that it becomes malleable. And then it, and so I, I, I glue it and then heat it and then mould it and then it dries and then trim it um, and then grind it. Mm. And then often for really wide feet, I do that on repeat. Use the uh, yeah, I do have a heat activator, but yeah, heat gun. And uh, I do have a sample of the EVA. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so I do. So you get the EVA in different thicknesses. I find if I guess it's soft or um yeah um, not too firm i don't know the number of okay so so you can squish it um so theoretically it's um you know if i was using that for multiples or like you know i should say hundreds mm -hmm. it's probably so we're not going to withstand and be mm -hmm. strong enough but um, you know, often I make it one here, mm -hmm. and I just want bulk. So um, and it's really light, right? And it grinds really nicely. Yeah. So yeah, this uh, lady stands on her ankle bow. So that's um, so she has orthotics. So that's she stands on her ankle bow. Yeah. So she's up out. She's completely collapsed. Whoa. <laughs> That's hard. Oh, it sounds painful. Yeah. Oh. And you know, often for those people, I say, I just I don't care what it looks like. I just want, I just want something that fits. <laughs> wow. How did you go about doing that? They just so come. This um, the same way with all my customers, I just do the two lots of measurements. So one. Without orthotics, one with orthotics, 
Stanton or Stanton? And then, yeah, Laya by Laya. Um, so next, uh, so this, I use George Carless um, geometric method of pattern cutting. So it was kind of um, how I was taught and I didn't have many other options. So I just got to know it really well and love it and it does have its good and bad points. Um, but what I, what I really like about it is that I can use someone's measurements and then make a standard from those measurements without having the last ready. So when someone comes in, I do start working on the last first, but I can also make patterns at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to wait to finish the last to make patterns. That's great. Um, so I've also just got a few tips here. Yeah. So I think that's the last picture. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, as my my other tip that I said before, oh. get it right the first time. <laughs> um, hmm. Which is kind of difficult when there's so many processes which you're making because you don't have a chance to practice each process. To get really good at it, so to become able to get it right the first time. Oh, so, um, yeah, another tip as much as you can try to follow theory, but in maybe 50% of the cases, theory isn't useful. <laughs> um, so, it's important to develop and build a relationship with the customer um, to try and get into their mind. And there's a quote from Bill Burge, who in the UK, fit the head, not the feet. Mm. Which um, I love. We can't be good at everything. Um, there's so many processes and hats to wear. I've personally always hated and resisted my knife sharpening. Very um, machinery maintenance. Um, so I hate it. <laughs> so, you know, for that sort of stuff, don't expect that you can do it all and reach out. So I have some sharpening my knives. Um, you can't please all people all the time. Also know your, know your limits. Um, two more. So shoe making is basically problem solving. Yeah. Always trying to figure out the next problem to solve. And the last and my favourite tip from one of my original oh, teachers, blend. <laughs> Lend. <laughs> that word came, yeah. comes up so often and with my students as well. It's all the angles, isn't it? Shaping and blending. Blend. And then um, you don't want your last, and then to have an ugly insult, you want your last, and then the insult to blend. Right. Great, good word. <laughs> blend. Um, so the, there was an independent shoot conference in the UK a few years ago, and Carrie Ducker had asked me just to do an interview about Tim Skin. Um, and one of the questions was whether Tim was an anarchist, a revolutionary, or a philosopher, or maybe all three. <laughs> um, so I think shoemakers are a mix of all of these, um, but maybe mostly philosophers, as we're working solo mostly um, in our meditative practices and often have the time to think and philosophize mm -hmm. in our gentle craft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But what brought you to New York? So what was your trip?
so it's it's usually by appointment, and so I'll say to people, make a shoe file and then collect pictures. Um, you might like a toe shape from a heel block from another and I spend quite a long time with that initial appointment to work together to build out that design and try and get into their head. Um, sometimes I say to them, tell me one, maybe two or three words that describes the vibe, the feel of what you want. And then they say, I want them to work. So to work, do you need to look smart or at your construction site or um, yeah so the communication is really important. Mm -hmm. Do you see a different trend after the pandemic? For example, um, definitely comfort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like the high heels are what on it. Yeah. So the dressier the, I'm doing less dressier work, but the dressier work is more People are tending to want to tick all the boxes. So they, want, they want them to be beautiful, they want to be able to walk to work, they want to be able to wear them for their corporate work. They, you know, it's um, they got to fit back for them. So working out that design is crucial. Yeah. Um, we were talking also about maybe doing exhibition pieces and or creating an exhibition about with um, families, shoes, children's shoes. Yes. Have you reached out to any no. museums? No, 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 not yes. Not How yet. many parents do you have of your children's shoes? <laughs> but I don't know. I can't them, but in um, three children, one per first season. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I'd always make them a little bit big so they'd last the whole season. <laughs> um, but, you know, my, I think the last pair I made for my son was, was three, maybe four years ago. He was, you know, a 15 year old boy. And my choosing got to wear sneakers. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, but I'd, I'd love, yeah, I'm, it will happen. Um, and I've always thought when they're when the twins are 18, I'll think about it seriously. Um, and whether I, because Adelaide is known to be the festival state, and we do have um, lots of reasons to exhibit. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, so that's a festival. Um, do you have a dream space or gallery? Is it going to be at your space? Well, no, I don't have a dream. I, yeah. I'd like it not to be within my space, but maybe it could be good too because then people could see the process. See mm -hmm. right. That would be cool. Yeah. Um, has anything changed at the pandemic, like professionally, shoe journey wise, in the four years? Yeah, actually, I, I tell a story often with my, not just customers, but new potential customers. Yeah, it was over COVID and you interviewing people and watching your interviews that gave, for the first time ever, gave me a sense of community that I've never found. Um, so just knowing that you know, there's other shoemakers out there um, and knowing where I fit into the world of shoemakers and um, knowing that it's okay that I don't do well to, Yes. 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 Um and also feeling feeling good about how much I charge because that's always the issue. And being able to compare with children's around the world and being able to show that to potential customers is mm -hmm. generally cheap. Um, yeah, um for people who don't know your price point is about is it times eight nine to us lately I say nine to eighteen hundred. So very old things. Oh, yeah. Oh, what is it? Yeah. 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 So um so US Australian dollars sixty six. 
it's about a dollar thirty for one US dollar. Oh wow. It's, it's how can you do and that? And then, <laughs> I don't know if you saw the interview, but if you see, she was saying how she works on 10, 20 pairs almost at a time. And then, then she also cranked it up so fast. Too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like so many that it's kind of like, it, it kind of makes sense, but it's not. Yeah, I do try and stream on it. That's how I'll do five sets of patterns at once. So sometimes I'll. I won't begin the patterns initially. I kind of sit on it. I like to brew a lot, I think, um, especially the last adapting to. Um, and sometimes that's really handy, but I've thought about it and put it off because then the next client might come through and it'll be really easy. And then I can do those two sets of patterns really easily and pop it through. Um, and, yeah. One thing I don't like doing a lot of together is the scarfing. Um, I can I can pass that. <laughs> you don't have a scarfer. I have. I do have one scarfer, but luckily it actually prefers the leather that I hate to scarf, <laughs> um, which is dry, heavy, thick leather. Um, but it's, most of the work that I do is not dry. So it's mostly hands up. And I hands up is different. Mm -hmm. Are there any local designers in Brooklyn that you want to visit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I can I have my cool. finger in the pie of the local.
but I actually haven't done it this year, knowing that this trick is coming up to you. Because it's often a three months. Oh, wow. Can once you miss it once a week? Or? Yeah, it's a week. Oh, how many weeks? That's a good pace. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's like therapy. <laughs> because, you know, we philosophize. <laughs> we talk about, you know, life matters and novels and novels. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ours is like very too condensed and intensive that I have absolutely no time to chat yeah. about anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like if there's a group, it's like everybody can talk to themselves. Yes. It's like, like, like you know, the fashion. Yeah. yeah. So, Going around, going around, yeah, helping out. Yeah. But do you do things like a five day intensive or is it just? I've only done that once. Um, which is exhausting. <laughs> and that was one on one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And she had done five days. That was. Fun mm. because um, it's normally just really my dog on, so um, it's kind of company. Mm -hmm. um, can you share any recent projects or collaborations that you're working on now? Um, particularly excited about some things and the works that you might be left yeah. over there. Yeah, so I'm um, normally really quiet in August. Towards the end of a season, very quiet. So for the first time ever, I finished up almost all my work. So I am going back to do one order from that favourite customer. <laughs> um, she's so great. She just was um, when she's finished one here, she makes the next. So does she ever buy shoes anywhere, or just from you? I'm not sure. She <laughs> might buy sneakers. But uh, and I made her fifteenth pair free. Fifteenth pair. Fifteenth. Fifteenth. Yes. I think we're up to about eighty-two. Oh, for <laughs> How long have you been making shoes? About twenty-five years. Oh, oh my god. Yeah. She buys a lot of shoes. She does, does She's yeah. got quite unusual feet. Quite short and very wide. And she actually lives in Canberra, so she's interstate, which challenges things as well. Um, but she comes to the visit, or she has to ship things? She probably comes maybe once because her mum used to live in the village, so she comes every 12 to 18 months. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, I post for a fitting. But you have her measurements, so yes. you kind of have. Yes. So, and I've got her uh, three sets of last different implants that I work on. Um, so I, I know, and you know, if it's been 18 months since I've seen her, I'll say, let's just do another set of measurements, see if anything's changed. There was at one point she's, um, her dietary said, maybe you should try products, so we did that for a while. There was at one point she had uh, burned her foot really badly. So we designed shoes around the burn, and it went um, Yeah, so it's been a, a journey, and mm -hmm. yeah, I've got a few customers like that too, but I've got to know their families, one in particular who had children at the same time, and so I always ask them, how are they going, what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody was asking about business growth. Oh, so when you're in the shop, what's the percentage of like you tending to customers facing and then workshop? Because you're hidden or is it more like visible in the shop? Yeah, so it's like half and half. So there's a um, so the locked door with a bell. No, just help themselves. I mean, yeah, so I, 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 after 30 years, I do feel a little bit tied to the hours on the door. So literally a week ago, I scraped the hours <laughs> off the door. <laughs> uh, every time I go on a holiday, I think I'm going to get rid of those hours on the door. 
but I do, um, it is useful because I am a, I'm an agent for a student of hero. So um, people come in off the street and draw yeah. off, yeah, with their crappy shoes that they need fixed. Um, and there's an amazing shoe that you have and you pick them up and draw them. So that's about a two week turnaround. Um, it's actually, you learn a lot, um, you know, seeing shoes half open, that how things are constructed, yeah. how badly they're made. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Works out of your studio he has his own yeah. store in Sydney. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he's an agent for quite a few different um, stores or R M C. Just he partners with different yeah. and picks it up, kind of makes the rounds and picks it up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. And, yeah. Well, that's um, cool. Yeah, and he's doing some orthopedic. Alterations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know, there's getting less and less people able to do that, so he's getting busy and busy. Mm -hmm. So there's a team of them, I think, you've heard about before. Yeah, yeah. 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 and then I can say it's such a different trade, yeah. like he's deconstructing things, whereas I'm constructing, and I often explain it like there's lots of different planets. In the shoe universe. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm in the spoke planet, he's in the shoe repair planet, or world world. And then there's the manufacturing world, which is different again to then the designing world, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so often people come to me and they say, I've got this design, I'm not going to manufacture it, can you help me? Um, like a maker for a spare? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can make a prototype, but beyond that, I might need to go to China. Mm -hmm. Which is hard because, you know, they have a vision. But, you know, there's people that are paid to be that little man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is not easy. Right. <laughs> and sometimes components are hard to find. But construction is a specific thing that you can do, right? Which company manufacturers can do that. Yeah. Or any person or something like that. I was visited um, recently by an Italian man who works for Irons. So he might be like, I don't know, he's got his finger in all the pies all around the world regarding you know, componentry and manufacturing. Um, and he walked into my workshop and just said, We do, the, we do all of this here because <laughs> um, it's such a, such a different technique. So why? why? Why don't you just go to a manufacturer and get your shoes made? But it doesn't work like that where I come from. There is no manufacturer mm -hmm. or companies that can make your designs. Right. Like their own. Make them the way you want them. Right. And also, like, making so many on one thing is like, for some people it's great, but like, for you, you're like, each one is special yeah. and different. That's yeah. what's. Yeah. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah. It's made for the Have you adapted any techniques you learned from Tim and George in your own work? Do you go by the book like, to the T or you have no. no. Uh, it depends on the design. Mm -hmm. So yeah, often something more um, like for instance uh, an apron on toe of the shoe is difficult to um, marry up from George's method, especially if the toe shape's different. So sometimes I might um, play with it um, paper on the last um, rather than going exactly by George's method. So I do play with it a little bit. Um, yeah, and often the way Tim taught was um, he was very open about um, techniques and what might work better mm -hmm. rather than being very specific about doing it a certain way, mm -hmm. like George was. You know, the tut tutting, if you don't do it that way, which so many of the older generation will say. Mm -hmm. 
bit differently, so whatever works. <laughs> That's yeah. Another question was um, so in uppers, your beautiful work, so delicate. Sometimes do you use 69 nylon, 69 threads, or I forget the numbers, you might have a different number. Yeah, so uh, there's um, 20 is the really heavy, and 35, I think 50. Okay. 58, and 14 size needle. Um, yeah, and I have to convert it. <laughs> I have to convert it. I think it's thinner than the ones we use. Yeah. So my favourite thread is the poly cotton, which you wow. just can't actually really apply it anymore. Yeah. Um, it has a, um, a like a really natural look to it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, like a vintage look. No, vintage look. Flat, flat, yeah, yeah, not that really shiny. It doesn't burn up like mm -hmm. it is like an mm -hmm. which is sometimes annoying, but mostly I like the look very Only for decorative stitching or also for It's just as strong. Yeah, I always say if I can't break it with my hand, then yeah, so break your hand, like cut your hand before yeah. it breaks. The other thing was like, do you have exercises that you do to keep your physical joints oh. and uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so I've recently started doing Pilates mm -hmm. um, and I feel so much stronger. Yeah. When I uh, maybe a few years in, I would get a really stiff shoulder. Um, but um, so unless I'm doing a lot of skiving, like the um, skiving stiffness, I want that. The shoulders and the hands are really strong. <laughs> yeah. so thank you. <laughs> um, and how do people find you? Yeah, yeah so the website, the local, yeah. word of mouth. Yeah, but, um, you know, after such a long time, it's a lot of work now. A lot of um, more recently, podiatrists are referring oh, customers to me. Um, yep, um, Instagram's useful, website's useful. Don't mm -hmm. advertise. Um, yeah, work trickles in. So. I wonder if it's also a different culture, right? Like, that is a culture that you go to specific. Yes, I do find I find Australians. I find I'm, I am a little bit of an educator in that. Certainly, English people they'll come in and they they know that a shoemaker is a thing because they've grown up with that being in their culture, whereas Australians don't know that that's a thing. They're like, some children don't know that milk comes from a cow, it just comes from the fridge or the shops. It's the same with shoes. Mm -hmm. so, you too, you? Yeah. So mm -hmm. when people, like, I had a lady in the other day and she said, Oh, so are you upcycling these? Or, so no, no, I'm making them. Um, and it just didn't sink in because it's, it's not something mm -hmm. that Australians know. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have to say, Make sure it's like they were made 100 years ago. Um, you know, it takes me nearly a week. You know? <laughs> right, just to do it there. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, there's a community in Australia, there's now like a bunch of shoemakers, and they're all doing their own thing. Yeah, and style, different styles. Do you guys have like a kind of a network? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't cross over as much? I guess it's a big one. Big. It's yeah, like oh, it's a whole kind of thing. Yeah, it's kind of far. Yeah. 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 But is Adelaide on there too? Not really. No. Um, and, and it's difficult to know when people ask the kind of machine that is there, are they going to like, does that mean um, 
shoemakers that are working full time, or does that mean shoemakers that are hobbyists, you know, hobbyists or yeah? So I never quite know how. You know, maybe that could five at most. Some um, that are just for business, and that that crosses the border. Me doing more feminine stuff to them, maybe two or three doing very bespoke um, orthopedic, I should say, mm. and then a few doing more um, just handmade, mm -hmm. and also the goods specific for yeah. different yeah, types of shoes. Yeah, they do their own thing. Mm -hmm. and they have their own vibe and small yeah. and everything. Yeah. So I've never met Jess, but he sounds amazing. Um, yeah. yeah, and I love the way he structured it because he started off as bespoke and realised that that's you know, really hard work. Um, and so he's kind of streamlined it to um, a number of different designs. Yeah, and manufacturing, even it's handmade. Yeah. You get a choice between, I think he's got lots of designs, but you get a choice between that, 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 and that, and then you can mix up what you have a lot of shape. Did you, it's called Wooden? Oh, I know. Yeah. Did you a beautiful house. Yeah. Yes. 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 Holy cow. Right? It's, yeah, this whole house. Yeah. yeah. They, I, my also question is, did you ever think that you will have your own line and have like a, like a collection and sell, sell those? Or did you always gear towards made to measure? I think in the very beginning, you kind of, well, I, yeah, I had a vision of um, making the designs. And I did for a little bit when we were in that city shop, I would just do it for you. Make a really small size range, maybe three sizes, seven, eight, nine. Um, and some of them sold, but then you know, getting left with stock, and it kind of never really made financial sense. Um, and why would someone want to pay for a pair of really beautiful headband shoes that kind of doesn't really fit? Um, yeah. yeah, so I've kind of molded it to suit Adelaide as well. Mm -hmm. as do you go to the beach sometimes? How the close? Beach. Like you're close to the beach. How yeah. far are you? This one. <laughs> do you always at the beach? Surf? Is that like no? You don't surf. Yeah, it's not really yeah. much. She it's not really much surf in Adelaide. Oh, yeah. Well, literally, yes, an hour away. But like, you wouldn't go to Adelaide to surf. Yeah. But you just go there to relax and yeah. swim. 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 Well, you can swim. What's the weather like? Yeah. It's nice so, all the time. Uh, so it's a bit cold. We've just come out of a cold winter, but winter for us is probably June's sort of cold, but July, August, June, July, August is um, yeah, the maximum of. 14, 15 degrees Celsius. 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 Pleasant. It's freezing. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then the summer. Like fall. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering what to pack, and people would say a fall jacket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. And then summer, you know, top boots between twenty-eight and thirty. Uh, average ish. It's a little bit way gone. Do you also make a lot of mature to like sample y stuff or are there more dressed or do you, are people very loyal to your style? Like, um, still to this day, like always comes to you for like the whimsical, the also fun, table colors. Like, yes. They know your style? I think that what do you call them thumbs? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Quick flop. Yeah. Um, you can buy the cheap thing, right? So, wide. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it's more cheap. Yeah. 
the materials and the colors you have a array of them or do people yeah. bring no so i um i think just before that i'm a bit of a, a, a leather quarter as well as the last quarter <laughs> um it's really if when a customer wants a specific color and how hard it is to get so i collect i have a what i call my leather collection but i've Aesthetics and the letters of 30 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have a sample book with little swatches of all those samples. Um, people can flick through the book and choose, and then I can figure out, bring out the bigger piece and just say, Is that what you were thinking? And then I might see it in a bigger piece and it's different. So, so that, that's quite impressive too. Mm -hmm. Yes, please do. Yeah, I'm going to ask you so small again. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 50 square meters? About 65 square meters. So I have half of this. I didn't get that. I'm not done with this. A meter is 30 shares. And the shape yeah, of yeah, the yeah, square meters. Yeah, it's square meters. Yeah, it's square meters. 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 Yeah, that's towards the outside of the large table. So there's a like a lean to shed with my lasts, <laughs> and then there's another shed out the back with lasts that are for sale. Of course. Yes. Do you have the other database of all of your separate classes of lasts? Do you have a database of any ones? Oh, no. 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 Yeah. <laughs> so I have. Um, uh, I set, I think there's seven or eight folders of all my clients' foot measurements over the last 30 years that I keep. And then I've got maybe 40 folders of all the patterns that I've done over the last 30 years. But as far as where I store the last, um, yeah, it's all in the <laughs> I'm, I'm not very not very computer savvy, so you know people say to a spreadsheet or like you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> So I do, there is another local Adelaide woman who's the same age as me who have been making shoes for the same amount of time and she, um, her kind of thing is more with the leather dyeing and she makes a lot of um, sandals um, and she actually supplies a local hospital with um, their um, sandal uniform. Uniforms are stamp samples? Yeah. Wow, school uniforms are samples? It's pretty well the only school that does. Um, yeah, this is all that off health and safety issues. Um, but um, yeah, so she comes in on Thursdays um, and she makes the sandals on the premises. But I have Thursdays off, so we cover that and switch up. And yes, yeah, so it's really lovely to have her to be able to bounce off to as often. Yeah. And we bring each other. It's like, oh, I've got this weird cut. What do you reckon? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you need that. Yeah. Um, oh. And like, I used to have a neighbour who was an upholsterer, and sometimes you know, I'll, I'll just say it to him anyway, even though I know he doesn't know what I'm talking about. Just I know that he may be vaguely mine. So what do you think about that same working this way and, uh, yeah. She's worked a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's about to 
mountains and patches. That's basically why we're here. Yeah, we're here in this yeah, space. Yes. Yeah. Because it's, yeah. it gets lonely when you make it on your own. Yeah. But also doing business. It's also like you're, you're doing everything from making all the way to the business and to the customer service to the everything. Money, which, which, is, yeah, <laughs> which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it keeps it. Um, like yeah, I never get bored, you know. And that's why shoemaking's so great, isn't it? Just like you know, there's maths with the pattern making, and there's the designing. You can incorporate some artistic drawing, or and then there's the, um, the physicality of it, and the sculpting, and the eye, and then the, the sewing. I, I love that part of the criminal as a seamstress. So. Um, yeah, and then they, and they feel the three D ness of it, and it incorporates so much. And the, the bottom stuff getting dirty, and yeah, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's why I think we're all hooked to make it. Yes. Do you think any of your kids they have it made with you? I think. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. So we all were at home and I took my sewing machine home and luckily all my, we didn't have a lockdown quite like we did. Um, uh, all the work that I was working on at the time were uh, like fresh orders so I had to do the patterns and the uppers and the sewing that um, lasting sewing um, and I think when Few months in that we were locked down or that we felt more comfortable about emerging. Um, that's when you know, I would open a little bit like what I know, just go in and do some grinding. So, yeah, the three children made their own shoes. What did you get? Um, a pair of white boots, kind of like Dr. Martin and Eva. This is a regular. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she has made herself a few pairs of sandals, but from the year she, the few months after she finished school, um, I often say that Aurelia is the maker of the family and hung out with my brother's a jeweller, hung out with my brother and made a ring, hung out at home and made herself a, a big um, spread. Patchwork with spreads and then hung out at the workshop and made herself some shoes and did a whole lot of beading. And if she's on holiday, she makes stuff, so that looks cool. But not shoes. Not like shoes. <laughs> Maybe ceramics. Mm -hmm. Have you been to ceramic studios in here? No, we yeah. haven't. Yeah. 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 And how many yeah. shoes are you making? Hey, no, no, I just shave them and wear them. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a maker. Well, not a, not a creature. Builder. Builder. That's so cool. And share some of the craft with them. And you make so much for the I only have like one pair each. In the 20 years. <laughs> so I, feel like, I feel like it's my way of communicating. So when I first met Matthew, I didn't really know what to how to portray or say anything. So I made him some sense. Mm -hmm. and, you know, but my bestie's just turned 50, so you know, I made her some sandals. And Ooh. it's kind of, um, it's a, it's a Gift and like communicating for me, yeah. It's great, yeah. Fun, yes. Thank you, sure. And thank you, guys. And thank you so much. So, like, what, 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 so what do you have prepared? What is your so? I'm going to do uh, just a quick standard um, pattern. I've measured out Kanko just before. I'm going to make her standard using the Georgia's geometric method. So, um, did you also have this, this one? 
Yes. So, what, um, what's, um, do you want to do with the oral? Uh, what's a uh, what's a uh, so the pattern will probably only take from the Wow. What? <laughs> that's not true. But that's just <laughs> standard. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the uh, my then my mum wanted an approaches and then she was okay to wait while I was having holiday. So I've made her um, some uppers and I've got I've only got one here and one last and I'm going so I do what's called tap blasting, so I put the taps in my mouth. Um, and I wet I have um, a wet moulded fish tan leather sticker and I last it all together. So um, I'm just sure that I should do a little presentation of lasting here. Oh. And then what for reasons that we got? Yeah. So um, these little silver things I finished up uh, last week. Um, I was just um, sliding down with all my orders and thought I'd just squeeze in another pair for myself. <laughs> How often do you make a pair for yourself? All the time. <laughs> I really need to like, I really need to do that. So it, depends, it depends how busy I am. So, you know, sometimes if I'm really busy, there'll always be something in, in the process of it being made, but it might take as long as it would for our customers. So, it might take three months to make them. Um, but yeah, I've always got another three much How long does it take you to make a pair of shoes? Uh, yeah, it's the most asked question and the most difficult to answer because you know, I might be doing yeah. it's usually an average of about 13 pairs at once. Um, so I'll, if, when a customer comes in, I'll allow, I say, I used to say six to eight weeks, but when I'm busy, it's maybe eight to 12 weeks. Um, but if I was, and that includes fittings as well, so they so before I put the sole and get into trial on. Um, is the actual upper already or is it No, I'll make it. So what yeah, you know, is it going to have to adjust? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. What if you have to adjust? Um, so what I say to people is I can't change the design of the upper unless, and I usually, I usually don't have to because we get it wrong this time. What I do sometimes have to alter though is the last. And so if I've lasted that, um, then I can just peel it back and alter the last oh, okay. and then we last it. Okay. Yeah. So I don't often have to do that. My aim is not to have to change the model and get it right the first time. <laughs> that's, that's good, yeah. yeah. Waste less time, material, yeah, everything. Yeah. yeah, it's all about streamlining and making it viable. Yes, mm. you know, if they, they yeah, think they're paying yeah. a lot of money, but if they're paying nine hundred dollars, um, you know, I've got to pump it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's um, amazing. Yeah, but if you know, if I was just making one pair, don't have to do any fittings. But I think I probably got. Been done in a couple of days doing other things, mm. um, but there for me, I know my last works. Um, you know, I didn't even you know, properly make an upper. I kind of just, I mean, yeah. I didn't have a pattern of standard, I just kind of pulled out something that I'd made on that last before. I was like, oh, yeah, that would do. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't have to scarf because it's bag top line, you know, it would get really simple. Um, but yeah, really technical orthopedic work that takes a week. Because I'm, you know, I might um, deliberate and think and do one layer at a time for last adapting. Um, you know, that could take a couple of weeks to get that right and then doing other things. So you really need your customers to be local. Yeah. yeah. And the Adelaide market, I'm just supports that. Yeah, but there's repeat customers yeah. and everyone still come and yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, that. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, show it. Yeah. I mean, I would love to see. Do you guys want to? Should we? I'm going to stop the, this because I don't think that's in the frame at all anymore. Joint, and then I'll work with that in step and do a little short here and walk 
Just really useful because it's got specific um, measurements. On it. So, um, so this is the heel height here. So there's a, the reason I like this is because it, um, there's a whole lot of kind of magic points that turn up. Um, so then I use double this amount um, and from this angle here. So that two eighties are one sixty. So, you know, George's method, I think he does like little dot, dot, dots, but I don't think he can do that anymore. Um, and then you know, he marks all, you know, this is H for here, and this is J for, you know, I don't do it anymore. So then this one here is this measurement plus 10, so it's 80 plus 10. And you know, I do things like this, and also my uh, treadle sewing machine. And I just think, thank you, whoever you were, to have made up this. Because it works. <laughs> That's great. I don't always write this at the back height. It's one, two, but that's that's where George's method is a bit kind of funny because someone might have a really big short heel that you don't want to. So therefore, it doesn't quite. So that's mm -hmm. where knowing those little tweaks is kind of handy. So, um, okay, so it's kind of that kind but not. The actual sequence here. So then we've got 110 degrees here. So it's not going to tell us the ruler too. Yeah, and being see through it's kind of really handy. So then we go to the Joint measurement, so it's eight here. Minus five, I don't know why, but it works. <laughs> so now that's 73, 73 divided by three is two. And two of those 48, so 48 up over here. So then we're, I'm starting to build into the Lasting allowance. So this is lasting allowance here. So depending on your toe shape. Um, so if you had a really pointy shoe, you can go beyond that. So then back to this short heel measurement. So 
So this is the sort of magic point J, and that's across your joint. And then and then this point here is E, I don't know what that stands for, but that's kind of like your the, the top of your tongue. Mm. Um, so you wouldn't want to go any further up kind of point. And then, um, so I use 20 mil lasting allowance. Um, and then to get the counter point, so that's this measurement here. Two, three, eight, one, five. There's your magic point. There's your magic point. And so, like a, a derby facing, which. So, if I wanted to design a derby on that, um, so much. Follow the theory, but from here on, like you, you know what the magic points do and what they're for, you can do whatever you want, basically. So, do that check. So, um, because if that was out there, then it would be all baggy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, it does look like a lot, but it actually works. So, um, yeah, and this is like that goes, you know, fills up that curve. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's for okay. cake. <laughs> but I'm going to keep that. Can I keep yeah. that? Because I wanted that four years ago. <laughs> Yeah, so um, yeah. So it's pretty when you know it, it's really simple and did you ever do the, the tape and that uh, at the tech college that I went to a few times. It was so laborious. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it is, right? Yeah. yeah. I think it's like like when you're doing it for the first time, like it's vis visually easier to see yes. the last. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, in a yeah. way, like it started to all come yeah. together. Mm -hmm. And then, um, Marek, Marek, yeah, shared recently uh, a slide. He does the, the paper, right? Yeah, and yeah. they yeah. sort of screwed it all up. And um, yeah, I've never. So, the teacher that I had at my tech college, I think a couple of years after I left, he went to Italy and did like the learning, the learning that pattern making process. And then, Brought it back to teach students, so, um, so I kind of missed out on that. But it looks useful. It's like mm -hmm. a stupid again, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. And so I actually find that quite useful sometimes. Like I said, like, 
doing an apron on the toe here, it's not really clear exactly, you know, it depends yeah. on how deep your toe is, it depends how long your toe is. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I might just you know, screw up a bit of paper or just sort of cut something out and mm -hmm. try and get that same long, mm -hmm. um, allowing a stretch and then um, try and try to have it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. then you don't have to wait for the last to be perfect. Yeah. yeah. But you know, again, that's just how I do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's great. Cool. Then you seem to be quick. Yeah. 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 As opposed to. Yeah. 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 And you know, people always say, oh, you know, what method you use and you know, like what software. It's like, why when you can just do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No computer in my workshop. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. All right, so shall I last? Yes. Yes. So that's yours too. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. so cute. Yeah, yeah it's good, isn't it? So I'm always going to a non local kind of um, crappy haberdashery kind of shop um, and hoping that I might be able to find interesting just because I go through them. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to find the narrow ones. Mm. So when I last, I use um, paste. Yeah. So I was taught to use um, by George Dextrin, I think it was called, which is like a, a like a really old-fashioned like paper glue. Um, maybe even made it mm -hmm. um, with paste. Yeah, that kind of thing. And then from there, I you know, didn't want to make my paste. I would often go moldy. So I um, used to buy wallpaper paste maybe odd years ago. But, you know, then no one was using wallpaper. So yeah. that's kind of, all right, can't buy that anymore. So um, there's something called Clag instrument. Do you have that? Clag paste? It's like a kid's craft. Paste. Craft glue or something. Yeah, and so I mix it with aquagia, which is like a wood glue. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's sort of about a half half mix and it's sort of just, just a disgusting kind of texture. But that's not. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, you can smell yeah, it. Right. I'm surprised it's like almost glue. Oh. Got all my hair without. I rubber band it. Oh, we brought this from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 and I bought this so I can chuck it out when I <laughs> sort of shake it back home and I bought my tap. They didn't stop you with I know, because you put it in your carrot. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so it was in my um Mac that like really like it just Oh okay, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> you won't see that stopped. again. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> so tax, I've gone through an evolution of tax as well. Oh gosh. And I get really fussy about what I use and I get used to something and then oh no, or you know, I order over like my 10 new taps and they come and they'd be 12, even though it's actually so 10. I like, measure it and they are the actual 12 new taps it says 10. Yeah, so I just you might do the 12 new well, Um yeah, so this is what I'm doing at the moment is a combination <laughs> of Mostly 12, and you'll understand why I'm saying. Mostly 12 more tacks <clears throat> for the um, sort of setup. And then often, but so I have a bit of a theory about not stopping with the last, as in building up is okay, but never, do, never taking anything off. Mm -hmm. It's like a massive no no, because if you've got a range of lasts and you butcher one, then now, if someone comes to you with a size five or size seven and you butcher the seven, you're never going to be able to use that range in that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's my never butcher a last. So I kind of take the last as they come, as in sometimes I might have a metal plate and I I just use it as it comes. So this one doesn't, um, but in the end after I've tacked up everything. I'll take all of these tacks out. I'll leave the eight mil ones in the back. And when I take the last out for a fitting, I'll use a repair as last. Wipe them down if I don't have a 
they will apply it at the back and then just make it clear back. So I don't have to undo, like, take all the tacks out of the pleats and glue under the three layers because I'm going to last that all in one. Um, and they just stay there. So these eight tacks are like really precious. <laughs> so I can't buy them any. Uh, but I do have a lot. So um, I last stand up. Oh. Um, so I've just got Keiko's pin on this table so to try and get it a bit hard. I'm so I'm scared of it, Steve. Last. adapted these lasts from my mum 30 odd years ago and this was originally what I was using was like fiber cool. mm -hmm. and it's cool. so I don't really use that anymore because it's only three and thick and you have to have two nails and I do, don't like the white molds um, but it's quite grippy um, so the powder is probably better for that so a last that doesn't have any build up you pull that all up I would almost not get bothered with that can I make a mess? Yeah. Sorry. Some will powder smell better than others. And they're super stinky now. The one up, yeah. Stinky. Okay, you've got. Okay. <laughs> and the one I've got at, um, at home smells like musk. Oh, it's really. Do No, no. So, okay, so this is. Um, Pre skived wet, like I dried it to come over, um, but I've just re wet it again. Um, and it's mum's. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, what do you So this is a belly, mm. edge belly. Mm. And so the reason this glue is good for a stickier is because it's a little bit kind of flexible, not just in its, um, when it gets inserted, but after it's dried. Okay, so I'm folding that back and popping that in and it's spot, pushing it down to down and up gets all confused with shoes upside down, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Push that in so it's squished in and then you know it's starting that lasting process. So um it's a great drawing. He shared it years ago on Instagram. It's about it's drawing on a finger with an eye on the end. You know, mm -hmm. you see that? It's so good. And it's like, yes, like, oh, your fingers are doing the same. Mm -hmm. So I've just pushed that in so that's all flush. Just put it on the. Yeah, just different. Yeah. But I 
it's what not a word enough, but it's so some chance depending on what um, what kind of upper leather it is, you have to be careful that if it gets wet so you can't stay moist in it. Just happens. Was it too wet? I guess so. Yeah. Blue, blue's actually like stained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes with the spider, it seems to. Another one I've already experienced. Disasters. Alright, so then uh, I'm going to put these in my mouth. So, uh, you put them in your mouth? Yeah. Oh, mm. oh my god. We shove them all down in there. Yeah. So that it doesn't go. In I mean, by that you're still talking. Yeah. 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 So if the phone goes or a customer walks in, I can answer the phone. <laughs> they don't even know. They're picturing the tree. You've never swallowed it. No. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. So, then, um, these are your aprons. So, I'm sort of starting that wet mowing, I'm starting that process, I'm doing quite hard towards me and down. I'm shaping, shaping the seams. There are a few, it doesn't matter at this point. Yeah. Put it down, that, sort of that, and you're on the line of the other edge. So I'm using um, um, the Vinyard Master pencils. So I might push my lip. Oh, you hit me. Oh, that's okay. Um, and then, so that's number one. With my students, I have like a um, a last sequence written out with what numbers, where did it go? Okay, so this is number two. Putting that fairly tight, and theoretically, I've got to make the last one out, so I should be putting them over to turn on. Yeah. Like I said. Right in the beginning. Here it goes out, we draw that if you turn to one. So different. Just the balance is different. Yeah. <laughs> and then sometimes at this point I can turn around and just see whether I'm on the right track as far as um, uh, the setup, whether it's straight and whether I need to sort of pull in another direction or not. So the next one is two, and uh, that's two, three, four here and here. Um, but I wouldn't want to be pulling it like that because the obviously the toe cap would be crooked. So um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the reason I like my sloppy lasting pieces is like it's so old. Um, but it means I don't have to work as hard. Mm -hmm. So then we've got what's that two, three, four, and we've got five, six at the joint or the waist part. Sometimes do a little wiggle of the line in the breath. So by doing this um, four-part setup, I'm 
way that I've got that nice and tight, and then pulling down so it's probably in the way. So let's see where I can put it. But then, if it was a normal shoe, I'd be pulling it down to the counterpoint that I would have marked. So at this point, I'm just kind of finding the lining, just pulling on the lining, because if you pull on the upper, then the lining is going to be all So the theory says that it should be about 20 mil higher than your counterpoint. And I've got 20 mil lasting now, so it should be about 20 mil from the feather edge to there. And then it should be a little bit of stiff nut mm -hmm. over and over, but you don't want too much because otherwise there's too much bulk. So, maybe. And then I normally have a slightly longer tack, but this one will be like this. Um, so, so I always thought the sign of hand that shoe is a whole other bag. It's everything. We say it. Yeah. yeah. But we try not to to break that hole. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? Yeah, I had a customer one bring me once. I just picked up her shoes. There's a hole in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> sign of hand shoe. So um then so I've started to get I've started to get that nice taut tight top line and I'm gonna do that even more so now by pulling at instead of like all the pulls are normally at 90 degrees, but these these two pulls here um, I'm going to pull that really tight. So if it was a normal top line I'd get that really tight. Mm -hmm. So I do a bit of a lining pull as well. And if your patterns are right, generally you have the, the theory amount of lasting amounts. So also the, um, the ankle bone is lower on the outside than the inside, so it pulls slightly more on the outside. Why is that? So I'm putting on the line first. And if you think of it's like that orange pit effect, so you think the lining actually needs to go in further, not only to pull the top line taut here, but so there's no wrinkles. The line is pulled a lot. Tighter, the gap's kind of just placed. Outside. And then filling the gaps on through the arch. So if it's boots, then I might use the, the bulldog pliers at this point. Sometimes they go side to side, but um, depends on how lazy or technical. So also my last two pieces are not just sloppy, but they're um, they're really warm, so they don't they're not quite as grippy here, um, and I kind of like that um, for a few reasons. They say it doesn't have to mark the leather, it doesn't mm. really shred the leather. Mm. Um, so I think Tim even actually sometimes gets a wine to do mm. the new lasting pieces. Lining mm. first. Um, and then very 
back. It's about wet moulding that stiffener that's in there. Yeah, so Tim taught me to tap last um, with the moth. Yeah, he said, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My son, my son told me that he's getting your mouth. Yeah, he's just word I know how to play Japanese. They do. Like you do. Yeah, I don't want that long one in there anymore because I want to stay. And then pleating, so there's a few different ways you can do it. You can um, do one big pull and make two more pleats, or you can pull to the sort of side and make, it's a bit hard with this leather to kind of explain it. Like some leather's quite blue to explain it. Um, just make a pleat, move it. Um, so you're sort of bending in towards the middle. And these tacks um, are staying there forever. So that's kind of it, really. And then, um, you don't have to um, do this whole section in three stages. Mm -hmm. um, so I do last the toe in three stages. So when the one is, once this is sort of dry, so there's another thing when you wet mold and it's stiff enough. I'm not sure, you know, the five don't get so fast. Yeah. So you let this fully dry before you do the top? Usually, that would be my preference. Yeah. At least I don't know. Not necessarily. I mean, if I'm pumping something out and I'm, I'm desperate, then I might do it over here. So that's it, basically. And then sometimes, um, depending on your liver and how well it's kind of taken, I might use a hammer. Because I might want a much more of a defined feather edge. Um, try and work that stiffening down flatter and a really sharp edge. Because that's the point where you want to do it. So you want the leather's responsive. Um, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> so um, yeah, I would take those top five tacks out um, from the upper back and contact adhesive glue under the line and do last the line. Well, you do that. Yeah. So you don't do the nails with yeah. the lining. No. no. And then um, I always use a, a heat activated toe cuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
first stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then last, the upper, you just say taste. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, you use this text. Uh, yeah, so I'd last the apple with this paste yes. with these tacks, yeah. and then that paste is dry. Take all of those tacks out, and then put it in the adhesive under everywhere. So there's no tacks. Wait, so, so you have to open and then do it, but dry it, put it down, take it all off, and then do it. And then just really last like, it, like last it. Yeah, it's cool. yeah, but it already knows where it needs yeah. to go by the time it's only shaped. Yeah. So you only, so you, so you would open this up. You would use this glue or a different glue, a contact side. Uh, this is for the upper. Yeah. For for, for in between. So under the, the under the line, I use the contact. Right. Music. Right. Okay. Or on on the bottom, I use the contact. Right. Music. So anything on like top. Right, mm-hmm. and so then you do the lining just from here up. Yeah. And then you would do the toe puff. Yeah. Then this, mm-hmm. and then pull it over. Yeah. And then. But are you you putting nails down then, just or this, yes. these? Yeah. All right. So then then it's all nailed. Yeah. And then you take all those nails out. And then you put contact cement. Yeah. And, and then you just last it again without any nails. Yes. Oh, interesting. Because it's it remembers by then. Wow. Mm-hmm. Oh my god. That's I would be so scared to do that. <laughs> and then so um, after the stiffness dry, and always the longer the better. Um, so we like to leave it, leave it over that. Yeah. Or well, yeah. But after I've done the toe puff and all the tacks are out. Um, if you can leave it for a week, that's great, but uh, sometimes you can't. And then I take the last out and fit. Um, if it feels feel good, then I put the last back in. Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever find if the, if the leather is a little heavier, that that last part where you're just, it supposedly knows where it needs to go, is, is ever a problem? Uh, not really. And then, uh, sometimes I feel like when the leather's a little thicker, it's like I feel like I have so much at the top. Yeah, yeah. So you don't want too much lasting allowance in that case. Right. Yeah. I just still feel like it's thick. Yeah, it's hard to get. Yeah. Yeah, it's and then you got to get it really smooth. Yeah. How many nails do you have left? <laughs> Do you make a proto for the client's upper? It's straight up just cool. Oh, how well would it just hold her model right the first time? Yeah. With the leather, everything. Okay. Then that's what she was saying how she makes the uppers correctly. The last can be changed, the fitting can be changed yeah. by this method. So that you can take it out, take the last out, try it on. It needs adjustment mm-hmm. the last. It yeah, so if, that, if it, they don't fit right, say um, your toes hitting the end or whatever, I know they won't fit them up. Um, but it's a pain in the ass, but you know, but peel back the upper, rip off the toe puff. I don't like going backwards, but if you just kind of think, um, it'll only take 15 minutes, it's fine. Um, peel back the lining, alter the last. So you may, if your toe is in the end, I'll add the height to the toe. Um, and then put the last back in, re-last the lining, redo a toe puff, re-last with this, the upper. Um, let it dry, you glue it, have another fitting. The, the fitting, are they, the foot is elevated and it's literally just the upper in the footbed? And or do they walk on yeah, it? Yeah, walk on it. They walk so on it. Without soles. What so, about heels? Um, so that I have to warn people. First thing I say, so usually I have a shank that these are going to sneak into the neck of shank. I usually say that <clears throat> there's a shank wedged in between this layer and this, 
<clears throat> and that's going to support the arch. Mm. You don't have any heels at the moment, so you're going to feel like you're falling oh. backwards. It's really important with older people. Because um, you do, you yeah. feel like you're like, yeah. your toes are sticking up. Yeah. Even though it's only, you know, in this case, maybe 10, 15 you know. um, Yeah, and then um, to get that sense of how they're actually going to be, I might have like a, a raise that I can just shove under, or I've got a mat at work and I'll put the heel on the mat. So, um, yeah, so the heel's on the mat, but then yeah, also, like it makes the heel. heel. What yeah. if it's a high heel? Then I that? put the heel block underneath. Um, but they can't walk around with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But they can go to sense of yeah. Interesting. Oh, I feel like I need to learn so much. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, that's, again, that's just what I do. Yeah. So, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so, do you use the, the toe cuff like that so in case you have to take it off? No, no. Um, I use the close key to. Oh, I've actually got one in the handbag, I think, because it'd be nice to be able to buy them. Um, so, where can I buy toy cups? Anyone? Oh, Anyone? here. Sell them here. Um, here. Um, it has um, a <laughs> size, size, and weight. <laughs> <laughs> you get really. So, um, this Australian company that I bought these from the last time, oh, small. Small. he said, Oh, we're not doing it anymore. Yeah. It's a pain to have to scarf them. And so, I ordered a thousand. Um, um, yeah. yeah, you can get that cuff one. Yeah, you can get some too. Yeah, you can have some too. And they're pre Right. Because yeah. I think it's easy to buy a sheet, but then you've yeah. got to clip them, which is fine. I've got a knife. Um, but then the sky is pretty sheet. They're so pre cut and styled. No, but if you're making a custom, yeah. If you bought the sheets and you cut them yeah. yourself. Oh yeah, no, but yeah. I'm saying that they're sold, yeah, at least here. Yeah, already yeah. made. Yeah, yeah. 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 pre-cut and stuff. Is that EDA? I had a chunk of EDA to show you guys what I used to do that. I don't know what I'm talking about. Is that these stores with different uh, spotlines on? Oh, these living things? Well, they have different ways. The uh, women, men's ones is just bigger. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see the new ones that we started using? Mm -hmm. You can take some. It's skyped on this side. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's the same way, it works the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't mind it. It's, 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 it's kind of well. the they should be okay. Yeah. 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 There's another one that we got that was like, Super thin, and I was like, "That's not gonna work." Mm -hmm. It just just heats up way too quickly, and it just yeah, it's too quick. Yeah. Like it's an art, isn't it? To mm heat -hmm. them up, and I used to have like a um, oven, like a just a bar heater. And I put it. I had this excellent technique, and I just put it on the bar heater, but it would often trip the electricity, and it's so dangerous. And I'm sort of like students, I cannot teach them how to do this <laughs> because it's dangerous. Um, <laughs> so now I, I use a, um, just a heat gun and get it quite hot. But um, it's a bit of an issue with really thin leather because it always comes short. Yeah. So I always, even though I can't pre scarf, I always do a little bit of, of scarf in the ground just to try and get rid of that bump. Mm -hmm. Is there any instance where you can make use of synthetic tesla? If I can't get one big enough for the full on orthopedic. But normally, in the really extreme ones, I can get away with it. Um, yeah, I've got one more size that's a little bit bigger than that. So, um, yeah, but I did, like on George's course, I used the, you know, he teaches how to do the other ones, which is great to learn and do really time consuming. Uh, my boots ended up, I think someone stepped on me and I had this kind of high kind of dent mm -hmm. in the toe. And um, so there's that fine line about um, wanting it thick enough to hold its shape if you get stepped on, um, but thin enough to be elegant to manage and narrow or fine toe shape. Yeah. I just find that it's, um, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it does everything I want to do quickly. 
So like you just have to get your technique to the point where like you use the yeah. advantage you know your practice yeah. style yeah. yeah it's not gonna show I think it has decent to us I think too so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we hit it up the other way we put it down on the um, yeah, I've seen people doing it that way. So the edge isn't so hot, so yeah. you can hold it. Yeah, you're just getting on. Yeah. Yeah, I really always tease me because I keep thinking that you're looking around. Oh my god, I think you just see it. if you have trouble getting stuff. Yeah. We have a place called Lift Post in Melbourne. And um come with that probably. Yeah, yeah. Sure that's true. Right. Left Post is kind of iconic and and has been forever. Um service is like pretty bad. But um yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 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 It's okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.